Industry 4.0 represents a fundamental shift in the way we work and live with technology at the heart of this transformation. To shed more light on this theme, I would now like to call upon our esteemed panelists and moderator on the stage. Mr. Biswajit Mohapatra, Head of Customer Solutions Management, India and South Asia at Amazon Web Service. Ms. Rama Kirloskar, Joint Managing Director at Kirloskar Brothers Limited and Managing Director at Kirloskar Ibarra Pumps Limited. Mr. Devan Shah, Track Chair of this theme and he's also an alumnus of the Symbiosis Center for Management Studies, Pune. I would also like to invite our moderator for this session, Mr. Akashdeep Makkar, Senior Manager IT at Veritas Technologies, who is also a proud alumnus of the Symbiosis Center for Information and Technology. Uh, thank you, thank you everyone. So, uh, it always uh, is very close to my heart and gives a lot of pleasure to come back to Symbiosis, uh, an institute or an university from which I passed out almost 10 years ago now and uh, to share this dais with some of the prominent leaders from the industry. So before we uh, spend more time, let's start. So when we talk about Symbiosis, by default a city, Pune, comes to our heart. And Pune has seen a big transformation, starting from being a pensioner's paradise to the Oxford of the East, to now becoming a latest major IT hub of the country, but always, it has been predominantly a manufacturing hub also. So today we are gonna talk about Pune and its three major pillars. One being the IT pillar, the second one covering the manufacturing pillar, and the third one, the umbrella of everything, the governance and policies. So to cover the IT pillar, we have Dr. Biswajit Mahapatra, who's also been a teacher of mine, so it's an Honor to share the stage with you, sir. We have Rama Kirloskar from the Kirloskar family, uh, a prominent name in Pune, covering the manufacturing hub, the manufacturing pillar of Pune. And then we have Devan Shah, who's also the track chair and the, uh, and the speaker for the Ministry of State and Communications at the Y20. So welcome, Devan. And without taking more time, I'll just hand it over to the speakers to initiate the topic for today, which is very interesting, yet very simple topic, the future of work, Industry 4.0. Over to you, Devansh. Uh, thank you. First of all, it fills, with, fills me with great pride to be here before you, not as the Y20 track chair, uh, but as, as an alumnus of this fine university. And it's an honor for all of us that uh, the motto that the G20 presidency of India is the same as the motto of our university. The values that were imbibed in us when we first climbed the steps of this university are being shared with the global citizens today. So now I'm here today uh, to introduce you to what is this track, what is Y20 India all about, what is, what is our track here as well. Before that, I'd like to, like to take you on a little journey. Uh, you see G20 uh, or the G20 group of nations, these meetings were usually a very elite group of meetings held, held behind closed doors in the capital cities everywhere. Uh, but India, being the mother of democracy, and you know, true to our uh, civilizational ethos, we have democratized the entire process. My friends, uh, I don't know how many of you all realize this, but we are part of a revolution, the kind of which the world has seldom seen. Uh, you see, taking 60% of its population uh, on, a, on a nationwide consultation to create uh, global policy measures that could you know, eventually impact 80% of world trade, is something that people can only imagine, is something that the global north can only imagine. And that's what you and, uh, you and I are here to do, you know, that's what we've become a part of these days. Now, when we say that, uh, why has India been given the presidency? You know, we've heard throughout the day that uh, it's a watershed moment in global history, it's very important that, uh, you know, we've gained the presidency, but why so? Now, here's why I believe that we are perfectly positioned to do so. I believe that India has come a full circle and if you look at, at, at our history, you know, and I'm not talking about uh, from 1750 where a quarter, quarter of India's GDP, or quarter of the global GDP came from India. I'm talking about from 1947. If you look at from 1947, India has received about $952 billion as FDI, as foreign direct investment. Now $534 billion came in the past 90 months. Put that number into perspective. 
And you see, foreign direct investment is not just about the foreign dollar coming in. It's about the world's trust in you. It's about the world's trust in us. It's about the world's trust in our leadership, in our opportunities, our entrepreneurship. That is what it means. Let me, let me tell you something more about it. See, this foreign direct investment came across 61 sectors. It's a global record, the kind of which the world hasn't seen before. No other country in the world can stake claim that it has received so much foreign investment across such a variety of sectors. And there's an unprecedented change as well. Now, this, foreign, uh, this investment doesn't come to one or two states. This has come across 31 states in India. You see, this is the engine of development that we talk about these days. This is what inclusive Indian growth is all about. This is how the new India is dictating terms. Now, when, I talk about, uh, when we talk about startups as the fu future of work, we're a country of job creators and jo uh, you know, job not job seekers. So when, when we talk about startups, today we've become uh, number one in the number of startups being added every day. We're number two in the number of startups, uh, in the number of unicorns in the nation. Now this is, this is why the Indian youth are today perfectly positioned to dictate or to show the world how these things should progress. Now there are, there are senior panelists sitting with me who will be able to you know, more delve into details about uh, of the more technical details, but this is what I had to tell you about. I'd like to leave you with one last thing. The Y20 Presidency of India, with respect to future of work, we've set up five sub-themes for, for, uh, for the globe to see and to discuss and deliberate upon. That's what we will be leading with this year, and that's something that you know, a lot of you all should contribute to as well. The first sub-theme is the mantra of unlearn, relearn, and reskill which is very important in today's time. It's, it's, you know, it's high, it no longer are those days where you could stick to one craft, learn it well, and spend your entire life in it. That's simply not possible. We have to keep updating ourselves. The second sub-theme that we have set is the gig economy, the new age industry. Gig economy is booming these days. Gone are the days when gig, gig economy was uh, you know, uh, confined to transport industry. Everything from finance to design, to uh, coding has now has been has been you know explored under the gig industry. It's it's generating billions in terms of revenue, and it's high time that we accept it and we adopt it as well. The third sub theme that we have set up is startup economy: how to catalyze this ecosystem, how to make it more dynamic and powerful as before. Because today the word startup has become synonymous with India, which is why India has also started another engagement group called Startup 20 this year. That's what we've given to the world. The the third so the fourth sub theme that we have set is. Uh, cross-border innovation, growth through collaboration. Uh, now, just by a quick raise of hand, I want to know how many of you all have heard of the term vaccine maitri? Yeah, fair amount of people have heard, heard, heard it about in the room. Now, vaccine maitri was when we gave our tech or our vaccines to the rest of the world and we wanted them to innovate, you know, we gave it to them. Something that has happened after vaccine maitri is tech maitri. Now, tech maitri is a very interesting concept where India has uh, laid its UPI digital payment system. The stack has been uploaded for any countries that wish to adopt and create similar digital payment systems of their own. And it's a proud moment for us that two other partner nations from the G20 nations have adopted it and are creating digital payment solutions of their own. And the fifth and the final theme that we have taken forth is how can we convert traditional economy into modern economy? Well, India today is known as the leader of the global south. And the global south still functions on a majority of traditional economy. So how do we lead them towards uh, Industry 4.0? And how do we make them better than they are before now? I think that's where I'll end and so, I'll pass So on. thank you, Devansh, for covering those five pillars. Before we move on to talk about the future of work, let's first dwell upon navigating uncertainty and managing complex work relations during the COVID times. And who better to tell us from the IT side, Dr. Biswajit Mahapatra, please throw some light on that. Uh, thank you, Akas. And uh, this is the apt question and right time to really start the dialogue on. Uh, as we all know, right, the world has really become more intelligent, more interconnected, and more instrumented today. The pandemic has really given us a lot of challenges. In the same time, a lot of opportunities. If you really look at, there is evolution of a new business paradigm. And I'll put it into three dimensions. The first dimension is all about new business models. All of us know, if you really look around, there is reinvention of business model happening all around us. Who knows, Indian railways, many of you probably travel using Indian railways. For 100 years of its history, Indian railways was never stopped ferrying passengers on its birthday. 
but it happened during the pandemic, right? So the business process, the business model has to change to tune to the new way of doing things. That's the second dimension that I was talking about. New age of doing things. How do we really get actionable insights? How do you make the market activation happen? How can we build something that can ensure responsive operations? Those are the things we need to really look at at the second dimension. The third dimension is probably very close to most of us here, which is new expertise. How can we build restless talent, right? Gone those days, like as you see the ta talent dynamics, uh, the talent has shifted from a ICEP practitioner to TCEP practitioner to PCEP practitioner, and today we are talking about COMCEP practitioner, right? Same person need to acquire multiple skills and build those talents to become successful in this industry, in this marketplace. And of course, orchestrated operation, which is also, again, very, very critical factor, right? Gone those days where you can say that, okay, I am part of this company, and this company is my competition, so I am not going to work with this company. In the new world order, in the new age of doing things, what I call it as competition, you have to work with your competition to deliver the best to your customers. So those are the changes that's happening in the industry today, post-pandemic. The other thing that is happening is how exactly you can build a resilient future that can sustain all the business challenges that we may anticipate today or in future. Who knows what pandemic is going to struck us in future uh, in next few months or in next few years. But today is the time. The time is now really to prepare for that in terms of practicing culture of agile innovation, in terms of making data interoperability really happen. We all talk about data analytics, exploiting next-gen technologies, which is your artificial intelligence, machine learning, blockchain, IoT, so on and so forth. We need to focus on intelligent platforms as well as intelligent workflows to make this shift happen. And that's the way industry is heading towards today. Gone those days where you can look for a solution uh, for a particular problem. Today, probably for a particular problem, you need to look at three different kind of solutions. What's your probable solution? What's your possible solution? What's your plausible solution? And then work upon that and make that strategic envisioning happen so that you can make the future very successful for you, for your customers, for your society as well. That's what probably I would like to say. So, thank you, thank you, sir. So our panelists did touch upon some really uh, crucial uh, phenomena, I would say, talking about AI, talking about ML, and uh, one of our panelists also talked about India going global. Now, who better than Rama to tell us about the way or give us a flavor of the traditional versus the modern manufacturing and give us a flavor about India going global? Thank you, Akash Deep. Uh, first of all, I'm honored to be here. I'd like to thank Symbiosis International for inviting me to speak at this session. Um, so the topic I was given was future of work, and I thought I could add the most value about uh, the future of work in the context of manufacturing. So let me talk a little more about the company I work for, Kirloska Brothers Limited. Uh, it's a 134-year-old company. Uh, my father, who's in the audience, is the fourth generation, and uh, my brother Alok and I are the fifth generation. So uh, it's a very old company, and we are in the process of uh, investing a lot in new age technologies, such as uh, augmented reality, virtual reality, artificial intelligence. Let me give you a brief background of what we do. So we'll, what, we are India's largest pump manufacturer. We make the largest and widest range of pumps, uh, going right from 0.3 kilowatt to 30 megawatt. Uh, we also make um, valves, hydro turbines. Um, so essentially, when you think about Kirloska Brothers, the way we are positioned in the market is uh, we are a high quality, premium pump manufacturer. If you want a fit and forget pump, you buy a Kirloska pump. And ironically, ours is a product that you only notice in its absence. I don't know anybody who thinks of their water pump unless it's not working and you don't have water at home. Uh, <laughs> uh, luckily, uh, none of those cases was a Kirloska pump. Uh, so when we are making uh, decisions about investing in new age technologies, there are two criteria that we essentially look at. One is business continuity, and the second is uh, consistency in quality of our products. And that has essentially caused us to invest heavily into these new age technologies. Now, let me give you an example. 
we started with our um, AI initiative in 2000. So it's been more than 20 years we've been collecting data and we decided uh, let us start with our sales function where it would uh, immediately benefit our end customer. And uh, the issues that an old company faces is we have many, many long tenure employees in our company who have a lot of knowledge and uh, expertise that they've collected over many, many years. And um, unfortunately, when they retire, companies like ours have a huge gap in knowledge and expertise uh, that, we, that we can see. And how do we fill this gap? So that's where we went into um, artificial intelligence. We have a product selector that has now more than two decades uh, of uh, selection data. So what used to happen earlier at KBL is if you were a customer, and I'm saying around 15 years ago, if you were a customer and uh, you wanted a pump, you wanted a sales engineer that selected a pump for your requirement, and you were really lucky that you got a senior sales engineer to select a pump for you, he would select the most efficient pump for your requirement. Now, efficiency is everything in, in our industry because efficiency means that the pump does more work in, in less power, and that means lower electricity costs for the end customer. So a senior engineer was great for the end customer because you got the most efficient pump. However, if you were slightly unlucky and you got a junior engineer, he'd possibly also select a pump for you, possibly not the most efficient pump, but uh, you'd still be quite happy. But at the end of the day, it's still a low, uh, lower efficiency pump. And that's when we started thinking as a company is how do we create consistency in pump selection and ensure that every customer of ours gets uh, the most efficient pump for their duty parameter. And that's why we started collecting a lot of data samples of our senior engineers since 2000. And today we have such a sophisticated product selection tool that you would not know the difference between the product selected by our senior engineer versus through our AI-enabled product selector. It would be essentially the same product that would ensure every customer got the most efficient uh, pump selection for their duty parameter. So essentially, we have ensured business continuity today in the sales function by doing this. Uh, the other area that we've applied in the manufacturing space is foundry operations. And foundry, as we all know it, is uh, uh, essentially not an art. It's a science. It requires each of us to adhere to process and quality control. It's like, uh, it's like baking. It's like when you bake a cake and you follow your recipe to the tea, you're going to get a very good cake every time, and you're going to get consistency, and that's exactly the case with the foundry and with the good casting. And what the traditional method is, is that if you had certain issues in certain processes, you'd end up with a defect in your casting. And normally, the process would be to do a root cause analysis on that casting. And uh, once you identify the cause, you do mistake proofing for your subsequent batches. But the problem is you still have one bad quality casting, which if you can't salvage, you have to scrap. And that's a waste of money, time, and effort for the company. Now, we have again used uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning in our foundry, where today for every parameter, we know exactly what temperature, what pressure, what cooling time uh, our casting has to be poured at or heated at. And if the process is not adhered to at that point in time, we actually have an alert that says, don't pour the casting. And so this, this method is actually more predictive and preventative because you actually stop the pouring of the casting. You never reach the point where you have a bad casting. So, you, so there's no scrap and there's no waste. Whereas the earlier mechanism, you had to throw away the casting. So I think we, in this way, uh, we have um, saved a lot of time and effort and money for the company. Uh, that's that's foundry. Tell tell me when you're getting bored, Akashdeep. <laughs> uh, I'm, uh, it's not about getting bored. It's just like you know we want to hear more from you. So right. please go on. So um, that's that's essentially what we did in the foundry. The other aspect is 3D printing. We've again invested in 3D printing around more than a decade ago. We have one of the largest 3D printers in the world that can make a, a 10 ton single piece casting. We used to initially use this for prototyping when we were. Uh, optimizing it, but now we use it for production. And uh, one great advantage of 3D printing is that you skip many of the dirty, time-consuming processes of a foundry. 
and you go directly to pouring. And uh, our printer essentially makes sand molds, so once the mold is made, you're able to pour molten metal in that mold, and uh, you get a very high finish, high precision casting that eliminates the need for much of the grinding, roughing, machining work that the traditional foundry method provides. And the advantages of having a high finish casting is that you have much higher efficiency. There's less friction when, when a fluid uh, flows through the pump. And uh, therefore, we're able to many times give far higher efficiencies than our competition. Now, other than just efficiencies, the lead time reduction is phenomenal. So what used to earlier take around six months to cast, the lead time is reduced to three weeks. And that's really very advantageous for certain customers, specifically in critical applications like oil and gas, uh, nuclear power, thermal power, where downtime is extremely expensive for the customer. So uh, what happens is many of these customers take, for example, uh, shells offshore oil and gas platforms. If they have a breakdown of a pump and they need a spare part, we're able to provide that spare part in three weeks versus um, our competition who does it in six months. So you can only believe the payback and they're willing to pay a premium for it. So it's a win-win for both parties. The other aspect is service. Uh, what we've done for service is today we're able to remotely monitor uh, vibration uh, signatures of all our products that are either installed in nuclear power plants or thermal power plants or oil and gas plants, and we offer this to our customers um, depending on their requirement. And based on anomalies in those vibration signatures, we can actually predict whether that pump is going to have a breakdown. And we're able to mitigate that breakdown by addressing the issue before the breakdown. And I think that this is something that our customers truly, truly value. So um, uh, Akash Deepa, those, those are some of the examples where we have used uh, the new age technologies. So Rama touched upon some important points starting from the foundry operations to quality and to efficiency and to vibration, the signature vibrations and stuff. Let's talk about one important aspect in the industry which nowadays may be manufacturing or IT or any other industry focusing on, that's innovation. So I'll request Devan Shah to share his thoughts on what he thinks about the innovation aspect of the future of work. Um, I strongly believe that innovation is the way forward. Um, but then again, then there goes the saying that there's none, nothing really original in the world. You know, it's always a copy of some something or the other. It's always been thought of or something like that. But uh, again, innovation is the way forward. And we can see it, uh, I, I believe we can see it in the market today. Uh, it's very visibly visible, where it be it uh, in the presence of uh, private sector uh, enterprises, or be it in the public policies that are coming forward these days. Um, there are a lot of opportunities for young people to, you know, come together, uh, either by themselves or with the government to come forward and, uh, and you know, uh, innovate and elaborate. I'll speak from my personal experiences. That uh, I don't know how many of you all know, but there's some. There's a uh, project called Fincluation Portal. Um, it basically stands for Financial Inclusion and Innovation. Uh, the word innovation being in it. So what this does is that the government of India uh, opened up a partnership for uh, startups and young entrepreneurs to come together um, to register with them, out of which nine startups have been selected, where these startups will work on delivering digital payment solutions in rural areas. Now, I strongly believe that uh, the, the, innovate, the innovation or the new India will come from the rural areas. And it's very important that they, they are uh, you know, taken along with us when we talk about inclusion or uh, when we talk about the last mile connectivity. So we're working, you know, these startups, these young entrepreneurs, they're working on how can we integrate the money order system into the digital payment system. It's very exciting when these things happen, you know, because as, uh, as kids, I, as, as a child, I heard, uh, heard there was something called a money order system. I've never really seen it work. But now when it's being integrated into the digital payment system, it's enabling that every single person will be able to use it, making it more inclusive. Uh, it doesn't make it an outdated service anymore. The other thing is how can we deliver microcredit loans in rural areas but making them paperless? See, these, these seem like very simple ideas, but again, they are innovations that are happening on a daily basis. Uh, I remember last, uh, last conference uh, in Vadodara, Gujarat, there was a company um, that manufactured manhole covers, uh, and they used plastic trash for it. Uh, they said that their, uh, they, I think their product costed somewhere around 1,800 rupees, and uh, the cast iron manhole cover cost somewhere around 9,000, 10,000 rupees, and it's able to take up to 10 times more weight than the cast iron covers. 
Now, this is a very simple thing. It's something that we all use in, a in, in, in our daily, this thing, but it's again counted as an innovation because it's something new that they have created. So I strongly believe that, uh, you know, young India is full of uh, opportunities and uh, there's a lot of exciting things ahead of us. So, talking about the exciting things, everybody knows and I've heard about the digital transformation or the digital shift that the industry is going through. Who better person to throw some light on than Biswajit sir? Please go ahead, sir. Okay, so digital transformation, very widely understood as well as misunderstood what in the industry today, right? Uh, so people do digitization and think it's digital transformation. People do some automation and think it's digital transformation. But if I really want to define digital transformation for all of us, I look at it into four dimensions. The first dimension is all about in the moment interaction. So today, none of us has really any patience, right? We want it to be delivered right now, right here for all of us, right? So if your business process, your business model invention is driving in the moment interaction. That's one component of digital transformation. The second aspect is predictive analytics. Do I really understand my customers better? Do I understand my business better? How do I really embed those predictive analytics into my business so that I predict and deliver my customers better is the second dimension or second aspects of digital transformation. Third is Proactive intelligence. Do I really, today as all of us know, businesses are actually rebuilding around experience, right? So do I really have that proactive intelligence to understand and deal with my customers better? Again, another component of digital transformation. The fourth component is all about speed, right? The, what we call as culture of agile innovation, right? Am I delivering with agility, with that flexibility? That's what is the last component of digital transformation if I really talk about, right? And today, as we move from more an outside-in transformation to inside-out transformation post-pandemic, uh, I think uh, there are a couple of changes happening in the industry that we really need to be aware of, right? The fast change is all about what I call as uh, digital foundation, right? Digital foundation is all about shifting to cloud. And again, three components there. The first component is how do I really build a resilient infrastructure? And I think Rama talked about that in her uh, talk actually, right? How do we really build that resilient infrastructure so that I can make my business future proof? The second aspect of that is, do I really need to leverage pervasive platforms in the platform economy to stay tuned to the business delivery and business outcomes? And third thing, no brainer, all of us know that, how do I embed security into my end-to-end -end operations? That's what is the digital foundation that we need to build. Of course, we build digital foundation. Then the next aspect is humans in the network. How do I really build ubiquitous knowledge management system? How do I, today have everything being online, how do I really build a global talent standard so that I can get the talent available to me as and when we need, depending on my requirements. So those are basically the humans in the network we need to really look at. And the third component is all about what I call as virtual collaboration, am I really automating my methods? Am I really creating some smart contracting mechanism? Or am I really providing very transparent, transparent governance to my customers? Those are the things that are a very integral part of digital transformation today that we need to really think about if we are taking a digital transformation or digital reinvention journey. So talking about so much about business, there is one aspect that's always been alive in the industry, but nowadays the industries are focusing more on it and having a separate budget of it. And that's called their CSR activities or the corp corporate social responsibility activities. And when we talk about future of work, I am sure from traditional methods to future of work, there are companies like Kiloskar who's already into it. So Rama, over to you for a question. But doing some research about Kiloskar, I got to know something special about your Coimbatore plant. If you could just let the audience know about it, please. Right, so uh, we started a um, all women managed and operated facility at uh, a village called Kanyur, which is outside Coimbatore in Tamil Nadu in uh, 2010. It was uh, essentially my father's idea and I understand that he had met a lot of resistance at the time because a lot of people said, 
or you have women there, uh, there's going to be a lot of absenteeism, uh, what will you do when, you, when they get married and go away? And uh, I think my father in his childhood was always exposed to um, my, uh, the uh, model of my grandmother and my great-grandmother who had also started a company called Mahila Udyog who used to, uh, that used to employ destitute women um, in the manufacture of bimetal bearings. So uh, I think he was already influenced by that idea. And uh, one of the reasons why he felt that uh, we start uh, all women facilities because number one, these pumps essentially go into the rural sector. It goes into rural households and in these rural households um, in India, when there isn't any water, it's mostly the women folk that need to get up at 4 a.m. in the morning and uh, walk many, many miles to fetch water. And he felt that since they're the end customer, why don't uh, we employ them and give them the uh, responsibility of building their own pump? So uh, that's when we started this facility in 2010. Uh, we employed around uh, 60 women at the time. Uh, they were all uh, school dropouts between the ages of uh, 20 and 23. And we gave them uh, six month on the job shop floor training. And um, then we started the facility and everyone was actually quite happy because they picked up very fast. And uh, these women were so good that they made it into the Limca book of records because they were able to assemble one pump every 17 seconds. Um, so even today, it's one of the most productive plants that we have. And at the time, demand was growing fast and there was discussion about starting a third shift. And at the time, the laws were not very conducive to having women in the third shift and our HR was contemplating having men in the third shift and this obviously, uh, the women resisted very, very hardly. I mean, very hard, right? And uh, they said, whatever quantities you need, uh, we will ensure that we make up those quantities in the first and second shift. And, and they actually did. They uh, did Kaizen on their lines and they enhanced the productivity so much so that we didn't actually need to start a third shift at the time. Now, other than providing employment um, and uh, employment to women, I think the other fascinating aspect uh, that was very satisfying for the company was the fact that Kanyur at the time was not a very progressive village. Uh, there was a lot of girl-child marriage. Uh, girls were seen as a burden. But when this factory came, came up, uh, I think it provided huge job opportunities for these women. And the minute they started earning, uh, you know, salaries from, from the company for their work at this factory, uh, you noticed a change in the attitude of their parents towards their daughters. They didn't want to marry their daughters. We felt many of them, if they got married, would eventually leave. But many of them relocated their husbands to Kanyur, uh, <laughs> which, which we thought was fascinating. And uh, even today, it's uh, one of the most productive plants that we have. What is also uh, encouraging is that many of these women are very ambitious. They are uh, ensuring that their children get a good education. They make sure that their children get white collar jobs. They're all aspiring to be doctors, lawyers, engineers. And that's when you truly understand the power of manufacturing in India, is that within a single generation, you can uplift blue collar into the tax paying white collar middle class category. And I think that's really the, um, the strength of manufacturing in India and what it can do for people at the bottom of the pyramid. Right, and I've just got the chat saying we need to be having a check on time, but I can't let you panelists go before having two lines, maybe short and crisp, on, we've, we've talked about, we've covered almost a plethora of uh, topics, but what kind of policy changes or what kind of government help would you like to have when we talk about the future of work and the innovation at the same point? Should, should I we can start from you, Rama, please. Okay. So, you know, I noticed that there's a lot of focus on skills and reskilling, but I don't see enough focus on actual job creation. What I've noticed, and that's something that our company faces because uh, we're, we're global, we, we export to 165 countries. And we notice that certain countries, take for example Saudi Arabia, they have something called in-kingdom total value addition, which is essentially a localization program. Now any kind of government procurement that Saudi Arabia does, 
uh, they mandate that any foreign OEM who wants to supply uh, to the Saudi government needs to have a factory in Saudi Arabia and ensure 70% local content. And my fundamental question is, and we see that all over the Middle East, we see that in America, you have make by American now, where they say 75% American content. You see economies closing. We're one of the most populous countries on the planet. And why don't we have such policies today? Because Absolutely. our people need more jobs than ever. We Absolutely. have Localization, billion localization is the key. Exactly. Absolutely, Rama. Yeah. So uh, I think that today most of our public procurement only mandates around 25%, which means that a foreign OEM can literally import equipment here, put a nameplate on it, and Correct. sell it to our government. And why that is bad, Akashdeep, is because money that the government spends is Indian taxpayer money. And I believe that that totally. taxpayer money should be creating jobs in our country and not in other countries. Totally, yes. Any, any suggestions, any thoughts on your end? Um, well, I strongly, like I, I, I reiterate what I said, you know, that India has been a nation of job creators and not uh, job seekers. So for me, I, I am really excited about the fact, uh, about the focus on startups especially. Um, and with the advent of uh, specialized universities that we now have, we have uh, universities that, uh, the Defense University, we have universities, uh, the Railway University that has been opened up. Uh, you know, with, with the advent of specialized universities, we will now have a workforce that is specially skilled. And uh, it's something that's globally, see, I, I agree, you know, uh, with uh, what Ramaji said that, you know, uh, Indian workforces, and Indian workforce is demanded globally. That's a fact that nobody can dispute at this point. Um, Indian diaspora is uniquely blessed uh, with, with, uh, with a varied skill set and, and the ability to adapt to any situation or to any skill set. And that, that is our biggest power. Right? So I believe that we, you know, we, we really need to capitalize on that and we need, to, we, need more, uh, you know, we need to create more policies that will empower our workforce to uh, you know, become diversely employed and uh, lead the global markets. Okay, so maybe I'll kind of uh, take uh, one or two minutes yes, and please. Divide my uh, thought process into three parts. First is future of work, right? So what is future of work, right? We all know uh, the new is going to be the normal going forward, right? And hybrid is going to be the reality for all of us, right? Why it is that? I'll just talk about one of my experience, maybe a story to all of you guys, right? Uh, I was consulting to a hospital in a very remote place in Chhattisgarh, right? And the hospital wanted to automate we talked about digital transformation, and they wanted to build a hospital management system so that there is no manual interference in there and the, the patient registration happened very automatically. Is it a very difficult requirement to build in today's IT context? Probably not, right? Couple of uh, select, insert, update, delete queries, few good screens, you can do it. But still, we put our best architects to build this system. We put our uh, best developers to build the system, utilizing the best technology, those of you who are developers, probably you know MongoDB, Express Scripts, Node.js, AngularJS, what not. Excellent system was built, and now the time is for the rubber to hit the road. The system is implemented in the hospital. Nobody is happy. The patients are not happy. The hospital executives who used to do the patient registrations are not happy. Come on, we use the best technology, best architecture, everything is good. And we did it good for the good of hospital. Why the hospital is not happy? Any thought, any idea? I know end of the day. Anyone getting any idea why the hospital was not happy? The human touch is lost. Human touch is lost. And we, we are worried that everything was so fine, why it was not working and why people are not happy. And when we went there, we saw, and we were very surprised. First thing we saw that uh, the person who is taking the Patient registration, he's keeping one of his hand with handicam on and other hand he's typing. And remember, he's doing that for the entire day, eight hours. His life changed for good or changed for bad? His life changed for bad, right? Patients, in ideal situation, they would have come and sit inside the hospital. Now they are sitting in the queue, in the scratching sunlight, near the window to get them registered. Their life changed for good or changed for bad? Changed for bad. And more so, if there is scratching sunlight, the guy who is taking the photograph, what he's seeing? Whatever on the sunlight is taking the photograph, everything is black, basically. Every patient looks the same, right? So that's the hard reality, basically. We talk about digital transformation, we do about skills, all those are good. But I think someone talked about human touch. 
getting that human touch, getting that field connect is extremely, extremely important. That's why hybrid is the reality. You cannot really do that without that hybrid touch. That was the first part of what I wanted to talk. Second part is your question around policy, Akash, right? So when we talk about policy, I know government has come up with so much policies. Today we talked about national education policy, NEP. We talk about national employment policy, where we talk about uh, whether school to, I'm sure probably Devans, you know this, right? School to uh, work and whatnot, basically. There are multiple interventions being really planned uh, to make those policies work. But at the end of the day, it's for us to really become vulnerable. It's really for us to learn, unlearn, and relearn. And of course, for students, I'll say that do not be afraid to disrupt and foster those collaborations. And as along the policies get updated, I think uh, we, we all will be there. And uh, this is time for all of us now together for the youth. So let's stay focused and build a new digital world, new digital society for all of us. So build a new digital world, a new digital society. Before we just move on for the q and I would just like to summarize that uh, our session was the last, but it technically covered all aspects, starting from Vikas, because of the business, starting to have gender equality, talking about Coimbatore, talking about some of the legal reforms and the thoughts that government should have. Obviously, the education, climate, and everything was covered in the CSR. So a brilliant session. Thank you to the panelists. And we take from here, and what better place from Symbiosis, the thoughts on localization for globalization. So thank you, everyone. We'll now move to Q&A. And we have the first gentleman with the hand up here. Good evening, sir. Good evening, everyone. I am Bhavesh Joshi. I'm a student at Delhi University. So uh, in one of the earlier sessions, Mr. Patel mentioned Gandhiji's seven deadly sins, one of which was knowledge without character. Sir, in the context of 21st century skills, especially data analysis, wrong use of data has become an important issue. We cannot deny the fact that algorithms are not designed on personal biases, as that is clearly reflected on social media, especially on Twitter. For example, if algorithms know that someone is a 15-year-old Muslim boy, so it will show them handpick videos against, against minority rights in India, which may be just one side of an issue or a complete fake news. But now algorithm understands his, his bias, he is more likely to believe in this manipulative news as well. So with this tragedy alongside, how difficult is it for politicians to take on our votes? How difficult is it for scammers to scam us? How difficult is it for terrorists to carry on with their obligations? where data can be used as a brilliant supply chain to spread hate or any crime for personal benefit. How we ensure as future policy makers that this data is only being used for helping customers and business growth and not in malicious activities. Thank you. Please, please go ahead, but before we move on, just would like to touch upon that our Honorable Minister also addressed this question where he said that before believing anything, because nobody can stop the WhatsApp university, but before believing anything, you need to do your due diligence. But let's have some more thoughts from sir. Yeah, so I think we all talk about, I'll probably make it very short, we all talk about artificial intelligence, right? And uh, we know that uh, the data is the foundation, data is the uh, new natural resource which fits into artificial intelligence to get the actionable insights, basically, right? But uh, many times, you know, uh, we invent technology, but if you really do not maneuver the technology on the right way, sometimes we, you, you guys must have seen a lot of Hindi movies or English movies in this space, basically, right? If you do not really use it on the right space, that may be become counterproductive, right? So that's why more and more you will hear about, and if you are interested, we can discuss offline about a concept called trust or the AI, right? When you are building your artificial intelligence techniques, how do you really make it trust or the so that you could address all of those issues is basically key success factor for artificial intelligence today. And uh, there are a lot of uh, research going on in that space and a lot of algorithms getting uh, developed so that right use of data to get right outcomes and right insights as part of trust with the AI is going to be the key success factor. Okay, uh, we have a lady here and can you please go there? And whoever's handling the mic, if you could just go towards the end to save us some time, we'll come there next. To the back benches, please. Good evening to one and all present here. I am Apshar Fatima of Modern College Arts, Science and Commerce, Shivaji Nagar, Pune. Sir, there is a saying that Industry 4.0 is going to 
have a very huge impact on jobs uh, in the future. It's, uh, many people are saying that many people are going to lose their jobs, but it will going to give new opportunities also. So as a youth, I have a question that how can we ensure that what are our relevant skills that we can ensure that we will be in this industry? And also that uh, it is also mentioned that uh, behind the screen that 21st century skills. So my question is also like that. What are the 21st century skills we should pursue so that we can cope up with the, this new technology era? So Thank I, you. I'll just take the one on jobs and if you guys can take it on skills. Uh, let me give you an example. Do you remember the internet boom that happened? At that time also there were similar thoughts that we lose jobs. But any disruptive technology coming in will always bring a lot of jobs along with it. Now, how do we go ahead? How do we cope up and what skills do we need? I'll let the panelist throw some light on that. So, coming back to the jobs part, yes, some jobs will be lost. That's the reality less accepted. In the same time, some new jobs will be created and almost all jobs will be redefined, right? So, that's, that's probably one way I'll put about jobs. I know there's lot of concern about jobs. When I say all jobs will be lost, all the manual repetitive jobs are going to be taken up by the machines in near future. It's already being taken up basically, right? Some new jobs will be created. Let, let me again probably tell you another story basically. Look at the industry. Every other engineering industry, who does the design? Engineers does the design, right? Look at civil, <coughs> civil engineering industry. Engineers create the blueprint. Look at mechanical industry. Look at automobile industry, look at manufacturing industry. Probably IT industry is the only industry where engineers are doing manual job, coding, which is probably in other industries done by manual workers, right? So engineers are destined to do design. So let's move up the value chain, focus on our core competency, which is design, and give the manual task to machines. That's the way I will put at it. Third part, what skills will be important? Of course, I talked about the next gen skills. I think cloud is almost becoming foundation skill today. So as a practitioner, when you want to acquire new skills, cloud is a skill that you need to acquire for sure, right? And based on that, what are the other next gen uh, platforms or uh, exponential technologies that you need to build skill? Focus on one area, whether it's artificial intelligence, machine learning, or blockchain, or uh, uh, IoT, or some of the newer technologies. Maybe some of you are interested to uh, work on high performance computing or com or quantum computing, focus on those areas. But the field is really vast. So focus on one area, go deep into that. That will probably help you to become probably an expert in one particular field. That will be my suggestion, actually. Devansh, you want to cover? Um, Maybe something on the learn, rerun? So I, I have a very simple philosophy, or rather a quote that I, I sort of live by. I don't know how many of you all have heard it. If you all have heard it, please complete it with me. Um, that, you know, jack of all trades and a master of none. Does anyone know how it ends? I see the guy at the end. Can we please? Jack of all trades, but master of none, often better than a master of one. It's always better than a master of one. So that's something that's, you know, that, that's, that's going to be important as we head into the 21st, uh, uh, as we talk about the 21st century skills. Uh, gone are the days where one core competency will get you <clears throat> where you want to be, you know, you'll be able to successfully sail through your career. Um, today is the era of soft power skills, you know, we, even when we talk about international diplomacy, um, soft power is the way forward these days. So, you know, my advice, or rather what I do, how I go forward is that, you know, gain up multiple skills along the way, be curious, ask more questions, uh, you know, whatever interests you, head into it straight. Um, the good thing about us is that we have a lot of time ahead of us. And well, when we talk about future of work, it's our future that we're talking about. So don't be afraid to take risks uh, in the set future, you know, so that's. Thank you. Yeah, at backbenchers, yes. Yes, sir. Hello. Sir, uh, I am Salman Rafi Khan from Maharashtra District Yotmal. My question is, sir, now, sir, say, ke technology both sir jobs provide karti hai. साथ ही साथ हम ये जानते हैं कि जब हमें प्रगति साधनी है तो टेक्नोलॉजी ये की फ्यूचर होता है फॉर द डेवलपमेंट एंड वी ऑल आल्सो फॉर रीच हैंडीक्राफ्ट कल्चर सो माय क्वेश्चन इज सर टेक्नोलॉजी कैन डिस्ट्रॉय हैंडीक्राफ्ट कल्चर इफ देयर यस तो हाउ टू प्रिजर्व इट सो आई जस्ट रीएट्रेट टेक्नोलॉजी कैन डिस्ट्रॉय हैंडीक्राफ्ट कल्चर या देवांश प्लीज देन यस तो हाउ टू प्रिजर्व इट सी 
I would say that there is definitely there was, there was definitely a danger to the handicraft culture and you know a lot of art forms that uh, that were on the verge of uh, being extinct. But uh, coming how we're coming back uh, to our to you know to to our civilizational values and uh, with the resurgence of uh, going back to our roots, uh, I'm I can very confidently say that um, there is a definite and a very strong effort being made to protect our civil to protect our handicrafts and our artisans. Uh, in fact, the, the India, Indian Postal Department, which is one of the most dynamic departments in India, uh, because everyone knows the post, post, you know, the post officer as, as a member of their house. That's how it's been. Now, they have come up with an e-commerce portal that is enabling artisans in any part of the nation to sell their products to customers, not only in India, but globally. Um, the recent Adi Mahotsav that we saw celebrating the tribals of India was again an attempt at ensuring that these uh, artisans, these tribes are brought to the limelight. And uh, this is all happening through technology, by the way, because uh, the, the, you know, you place an order. Adi Mahotsav also had a website where you could place an order. Eco, you know, the, you were delivering handicrafts from one part of uh, the nation or one part of the state to, uh, to across the globe. Uh, apart from that, what has been happening now is that there's also a lot of civil societies that have taken this cause forward. Civil society organizations have been dedicatedly working towards preserving uh, artifacts and preserving handicrafts, be it handloom from Rajasthan and Gujarat, be it uh, uh, bamboo products uh, from the tribal areas of Northeast. So I would definitely say that while there was a danger that handicrafts might be lost, technology can definitely be used for uh, preserving it, and it is very well being used right now as well. Correct. So, very interesting question coming. The volunteer wants to ask a question, right? So that's a very good thing that the volunteers are also totally engrossed. Yes, Please sir. Go ahead. I hope I'm audible. So, good evening, everyone. I'm Alicia Piran from Symbiosis Institute of Health Sciences. So, my question is: uh, So, what are the innovations, uh, practices, or developments in your own respective uh, professional career paths you feel is contributing in the present and will contribute in the future as well? So, like Rama Ma'am talked about the 3D printing and the time saved by it. So, what do you do you feel? Was it question directed? Yeah, to, uh, or to the, entire uh, the panel? panels, yeah. So I think um, uh, the innovation really, in terms of technology, I feel that uh, the new age tools are not going to replace design ability, innovation ability, creative ability. And that's something I wanted to um, answer for the last uh, question about handicrafts as well, is anything that requires creativity, uh, will, it'll be a while before technology replaces it. Uh, anything that requires mass production, programming, configuration, that machines will do. Okay, gentlemen at the end. Yeah. Uh, hello, I'm audible. Thank you. Uh, good evening to the dignitaries. Uh, I just had a uh, very simple question, sir. We had a reference to Mahatma Gandhi and his idea of developing India was going towards the villages and having a decentralized development and industries uh, based on agri or based on the uh, rural kind of uh, economy. So what we are seeing right now, if we talk about Pune city, we have very concentrated kind of industries and that is imposing very much pressure on its natural resources. Even the municipality is facing lots of issue in, in terms of handling industries, the waste, the sewage and everything. Whereas there are tier two and tier three cities in Maharashtra and India that are waiting for the industries to come up over there and provide some employment, provide some develop, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, provide some development. So uh, what are your ideas of a decentralized development and how this industry 4.0 can bring development to those tier 2, tier 3 cities where the youngsters are mostly migrating towards this uh, metro cities, sir? So I think when um, industries decide a location, there are many factors that determine whether somebody will set up a factory in a certain location. Number one, it's supply chain. Number two, access, right? Roads, road networks have to be there because you need to bring in material, bring out finished goods. And the third is also talent. And that's one of the reasons why industry and you know you have uh, these uh, industry committees that keep talking to the government about enhancing uh, skilling and not just concentrated around metros but also in rural areas. I think having skilled manpower that is local is very important. So these are some of the few uh, criteria that industries look at before setting up in certain areas. Uh, I completely agree, you know, there's a lot of factors that goes in it, but when it comes to creating opportunities, 
you should be the one creating the opportunity you know uh, i remember i just i remember recently i was reading about uh, this young woman from um, thane who who created who you know submitted a policy proposal to the government and she ended up creating a, a school on uh, on wheels for uh, you know children of the rural areas so that's something maybe you could look into you know for creating opportunities the government is encouraging um, manufacturing corridors all across the nation so when you see the absence of an opportunity you very well could be the opportunity creator so that's something i feel that you should take away i think we are in a 100 year journey towards uh, changing the whole world and leveraging technology to get the right outcomes i'll give you very small examples since you talked about rural india and that's very close to me as well right i come from a very rural place several years back and i'm still connected to my roots so let's talk about a very small place. Kobalam, you guys know in Kerala? Some of you will know probably, maybe for a holiday destination, right? <laughs> and Kobalam, there are people whose daily living is based on fishing, right? They go, put the net on the sea, whatever fish they get, that's what they sell and uh, kind of run their family, basically, right? right? Do you think there is any predictability if today they put the net on the sea, they will get the same amount of fishes that they got yesterday? If today they don't get anything, their family is not having food that day, right? How do they manage that? And I was amazed to see, uh, probably I'll not take the company name, the company is helping them to predict if they put the net on the sea, that's the amount of fish, 20 kgs of fish or 50 kgs of fish they are going to get. How, yeah, how they, how they are doing it? Uh, they are looking at the digital uh, remote sensing data, the satellite data that comes from, they are analyzing vegetation, Right? They are analyzing the sea depth, water temperature, all those things are modeling that in a geographic information system model to predict that if this is the condition I get 20 kgs of fish yesterday, today I am going to get the same if the, all the parameters where I am putting the net is matching that. That's the change India is going through basically, right? Again, another uh, uh, engineering student in Odisha whom I met, he has come up with a device that uh, he can put it on your retina and say what's your blood sugar level. That, and look at how difference it will make in the rural India where people do not have even facility to go to a uh, pathology lab and give their blood and test what is their uh, BSL level basically. Right? Those are the kind of changes that India is going through today. And it will, it, the story will only continue uh, on the positive side basically. That's why I said it's a hundred years journey that we are going through. Right? Coming back to some of the challenges that you talked around Pune, other cities, right? So I think most of the cities are really gearing up, right? And again, I, I can talk about Odisha basically. I was traveling there on the national highway. I saw that there are sensors. Uh, if you cross the speed limit, you are already notified. The notice come to your, uh, which, which probably was not uh, seen in India for a long time. Of course, you can expect that in UK or US or some progressive countries. But today, right here uh, is happening in India, right? That's the way it's changing. I think it's a good change. And we all should be feeling proud of that and should be feeling happy about those changes. Thank you. So I hope, guys, we are really short on time. So on that note, we will have to close this session. Uh, the moderators and the speakers will be outside. So if you want to interact with us, we are more than welcome. I'm sure everybody will happy to be spent some time with you. On that note, I'll hand it over to you, ma'am, please. Thank you to our panelists and moderator for such an enlightening discussion. How you all touched upon the hand played by technology and specifically Industry 4.0 in changing the sphere of businesses and elevating the quality of human lives was an enriching experience for everyone present here. We would now like to present a token of our appreciation to our panelists and moderator. For that, I would like to call upon stage Dr. Vidya Yeravdekar, Pro-Chancellor, Symbiosis International University.